Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Harvey Mansfield, and this is the program on constitutional government at Harvard. We're also uh, pleased by uh, the directorship of Anna Mansfield, my wife, and Andy Swick. And I see sitting over here Shep Melnick, a longtime friend of the and coadjutor of the program on constitutional government. Our guest today is Jeannie Suk Gerson. Uh, Jeannie Sue Gerson is the Watson Professor of Law at the Harvard <laughs> Law School. I'm sure there must be a Holmes professor also. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Okay. Right. I'm working my way up to that one. All right. <laughs> yeah, well, she's held us uh, or, or been there since 2006. She uh, clerked for David Souter in the Supreme Court and Harry Edwards, the appellate court. She's a graduate of Yale, 1995, got a um, DPhil at Oxford soon after, and uh, graduated from uh, Harvard Law School in 2002. She is the author of At Home in the Law, which is about domestic violence and how that's been affected by the law, and <clears throat> A Light Inside, Odyssey of Art, Life, and Law. She's uh, won a teaching prize at the Harvard Law School, and she won a Guggenheim Fellowship, like other famous people. And she writes for the New Yorker. How about that? Her topic is the end of affirmative action, <clears throat> and she's going to speak on the day um, in which, unhappily, Sandra Day O'Connor died. Uh, having seen her wish fulfilled of the end of affirmative action. Hmm. And that's um, our topic for today. So Jeannie Sue Gerson. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. Thank you. Um, so as you know, in June, the Supreme Court overruled its affirmative action precedents, and the court declared <coughs> that colleges and universities can no longer use race in admissions to attempt to create a diverse class of students. The ruling is important, not just for college admissions, but also for its implications for concepts of equal protection, discrimination, and equality elsewhere, not just in education, but in employment and in myriad institutions that currently consider race in distributing <coughs> resources and benefits and engage in some kind of selection of some people and not others. Furthermore, what we have understood as the civil rights consensus for a number of decades is arguably being toppled or has been toppled by this case and replaced with a new vision of civil rights, though that has been in the works for some time, building up to 2023. So how does the future of affirmative action relate to the past. So let me begin with a debate that came out of the infamous case of Plessy versus Ferguson, and it is still a debate that is still alive today. The 14th Amendment had been ratified in 1868, and the Supreme Court in 1896 upheld racial segregation in a case about a Louisiana law that required separate railway cars for black and white passengers. And this was during the post-Reconstruction period when violence and intimidation against black Americans were commonplace and when lynching was at record highs. The political climate was incredibly hostile to racial equality. And at the same time, there was an influx of immigrants heightening American nativist anxieties. And so the hostility against Chinese immigrants had led Congress to pass the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. And there were, you know, here at Harvard in New England, um, intellectual elites, such as Holmes Sr., um, <laughs> notably at Harvard, um, who were drawn to a racialist science of eugenics and social Darwinism that would fuel policies of involuntary sterilization of people who were deemed unfit to reproduce um, or 
feeble-minded, which was a specific term that was applied often to women. So the Plessy case, which said that separate but equal is consistent with the 14th Amendment, has been reviled and rejected. But Plessy's continuing relevance lies in Justice Harlan's famous dissent. And Justice Harlan condemned <coughs> segregation as unlawful in that dissent. His words are routinely quoted. Uh, he said, in view of the Constitution, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. So, and, and so he, this is a celebrated dissent by Justice Harlan. Um, and there are two strands or theories of discrimination that have been extracted from that passage. Um, one strand is the metaphor of colorblindness that the idea that taking race into account reflects presumptively irrational prejudice. And this is known as the anti-classification theory of equal protection, um, in which race is an invalid basis on which to make distinctions among individuals. Then the second strand is the idea that there is no caste here, that the law should not underwrite a racial hierarchy that subordinates one class of citizens to another. So that's not necessarily about distinctions between races, but about subordinating one race to another. And so this is known as the anti-subordination theory, and that resists a race-based dominance and subordination of citizens. Um, in Harlan's dissent, the anti-classification and anti-subordination theories both pointed in the same direction, which is to disapprove of racial segregation. But in later cases, um, the two theories diverge and even become oppositional. Also notable in Harlan's celebrated dissent was his comment about Chinese people, which you know, if you just read on a little further, which many people don't bother to do, you read on in that, in that um, dissent, and what he says is that Chinese people are, quote, a race so different from our own that we do not permit them uh, per permit those belonging to it to become citizens of the United States. And he noted in that dissent that the Chinese people are, quote, with few exceptions, absolutely excluded from our country. And of course, he's referring to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Um, and his point in mentioning the Chinese in this opinion was that if even Chinese people could ride in the same coach with white citizens, then it didn't make sense that you wouldn't let black citizens, citizens, many of whom had fought in the Civil War, to, uh, that, that it wouldn't make sense to disallow black citizens to ride in the coach with white citizens. Um, because after all, they're citizens, and they are you know, people who've sacrificed um, for the Union. And indeed, in the decades after the Civil War, Republicans and Democrats saw Chinese immigrants as kind of an invading and unassimilable horde of people um, and senators in Congress who were supporting their exclusion called them, quote, a degraded and inferior race whose machine-like ways would make it difficult for US laborers to compete with them. Um, so okay, a few decades later, it's 1920 <clears throat> at Harvard College, and the proportion of Jewish students is threatening to exceed a quarter of the class. And some, are some in the university feared that the college would be overrun by Jews who were considered very strong academically, but they were thought to be lacking in character and personality. And so Harvard's president, Abbott Lawrence Lowell, wanted to counteract what he called a, quote, dangerous increase in the proportion of Jews. And he proposed a Jewish quota of 15%. Um, but instead of that kind of blatant discrimination, Harvard officials said, you know, let's do something different. Um, and so Harvard ad adopted a softer policy <laughs> to consider factors of personality and background in, uh, instead of just academic achievement. And so they also included um, diversity, namely in this instance, geographical diversity. Because if you, because Jews um, were mainly immigrants who hailed from the Northeast, 
And so if you thought about geographical diversity, you would include the Midwest where there weren't a lot of Jews. And so geographical diversity would be a way to um, get more non-Jews into the pool. And, um, and if you considered uh, criteria that were not just academic, but like thought about, is this candidate well-rounded? What is the diversity they, they bring to the university? Um, you could put a new emphasis on these non-academic factors, including personal qualities like character and fitness, or geographical diversity, or legacy status, which many Jews did not have. So with these kinds of changes in 1926, um, which made the admissions process more holistic, um, Harvard managed to reduce the Jewish population of Harvard College to 15%, and then eventually by 1930, it was 10% of Harvard undergraduates. Um, okay, so then through the next decades, Har the Harvard Admissions Office is refining this idea of holistic admissions and diversity, and, and it, it develops into a holistic process that is trying to assemble a diverse class on many different kinds of dimensions, including race, in keeping with the university's <coughs> self-conscious responsibility of socially engineering the American elite. And it was immediately after Martin Luther King died that the university actually made a public announcement that they would be reaching out and making a special effort to admit more black applicants than they had in the past. Um, so now, Brown versus Board of Education eventually overruled Plessy versus Ferguson. And it finally declared segregation a violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. But in the opinion, if you read the opinion, one issue that the court faces there and confronts is that the original meaning of the 14th Amendment suggests that the concept of equal protection was compatible with racial segregation. And that was because members of Congress who had drafted the 14th Amendment um, also knew that um, in the District of Columbia, which Congress controlled, public schools were and remained segregated after the 14th Amendment. And that was not considered to be a violation of the 14th Amendment. So an originalist could infer that segregation did not viol violate equal protection. And the court in Brown thus de-emphasized original meaning and instead the court pointed to social circumstances that required the meaning of the 14th Amendment to change. And because education was so important as a foundation of citizenship in a democracy, public education couldn't occur, shouldn't occur in racially separate spaces. And equality, therefore, required integration of the races. So Brown versus Board of Education referred back specifically to Harlan's dissent. And the two principles mentioned there, colorblindness and anti-subordination. And again, in Brown versus Board of Education, you take the two principles, they point in the same direction, which is in favor of desegregation and integration. Okay, at Harvard, they've now had several decades of considering applicants' um, diversity and personal qualities in admissions. And the Crimson reports in as early as 1969, like in, in a Crimson article, they report that there is just about no correlation between admission to Harvard and factors like SAT scores and class rank. Like it's just not predictive of whether you're gonna get in. But there's better than a 90% correlation between admissions and the personal rating score that is assigned by the admissions office based on interviews, recommendations from the high school teachers and counselors, and personal essays, that what, what the score that you get on that is very predictive of whether you're going to get in, but the SAT score is not very predictive. Um, so the Supreme Court's engagement with affirmative action in university admissions began in 1978 in Bakke versus the Regents of the University of California. And um, Justice Powell there held that the use of an individual's race as a factor for the specific purpose of selecting a diverse class is lawful, but only if it is done without employing racial quotas and not for the broader purpose of remedying the effects of societal discrimination. So the court rules out of contention 
the idea that you'd be doing this to compensate for, remedy the fact that the, the, the discrimination that had occurred for centuries before. That's not a compelling interest, the court says. The only compelling interest that the court allows is diversity. The idea that you need to uh, you know, have a, a diverse array of students in the university to accomplish uh, an educational mission that the university may adopt. Um, and the court's ambivalence portended the public's uneasy attitude to race-based affirmative action, because on the one hand, it's the court saying, racial quotas are bad, terribly forbidden. And on the other hand, it's completely you know, understandable and even a compelling interest to use race to a assemble a diverse class, right? They're kind of talking in, in both veins, and so you've got to you know, create this narrow path where you avoid quotas, but you can use race in a holistic admission system. Um, so in Baki, one thing that's related to the free speech issue, I think, uh, and I find it really interesting, it's the court considers academic freedom to be an important interest that's being promoted. Um, and this is the academic freedom of a university to make its own judgments as to education, um, and that that would include the selection of its own students, that the makeup of its student body, that that's the university's academic freedom. And so the university had, the court says, a right to select those students who will contribute the most to the robust exchange of ideas, which is of paramount importance in the fulfillment of its mission. So the idea here is that diversity is related to free exchange, the robust debates, the open inquiry that you would think a university would be in favor of. Um, and so that's how diversity gets tied into academic freedom. And a school could determine that a student from a certain background could bring experiences and outlooks and ideas that enrich the training of its students and better equip its graduates to render with understanding their vital service to humanity. That's what the court says. So one thing Baki did, what was you know the practical effect of Baki was to provide a roadmap for all the schools in the country who um, we're doing admissions. And so what happened there was that Baki quoted directly from the amicus brief that Harvard submitted in that case. That, that case was about the University of California, but Harvard submitted a brief um, that was very much just describing what Harvard admissions office was doing. And so Harvard had written that, and this is now quoting for the amicus brief, which is then directly incorporated into the opinion. For the large middle group of applicants deemed capable of doing good work in their courses, the race of an applicant may tip the balance in his favor, just as geographical origin or life spent on a farm may tip the balance in other candidates' cases. A farm boy from Idaho can bring something to Harvard College that a Bostonian cannot offer. Similarly, a black student can usually bring something that a white person cannot offer. And so the court explicitly approves this way of considering race and you know, note the specific mention of a farm by, boy from Idaho, which is like a nod to the geographical diversity system that came about in the 1920s. So, okay, so that's what schools did after Baki. They would try to avoid anything that looked like a, or smelled like a quota, and they would consider an applicant's race as one factor among many. And around this time, the US sees an enormous rise also in Asian immigration. And that brings scholastic performance by Asian Americans that exceeds that of other groups in high school, including white students, in part because of US immigration policies that favored educated professionals to admit into the country. Right? And my family's immigration in 1979 would be like classic you know, example. So Asian American students quickly become overrepresented in the country's most selective schools. And so now you have a situation where if you give Asian Americans a plus for their race, and if you say, oh, you bring a racial diversity, then what's going to happen? Well, it's going to end up that Asian numbers would overwhelm the school, including overwhelm white students. And so admissions officers, you know, sure enough, 
what you're seeing is admissions officers are describing Asian Americans with um, adjectives that are similar to those used to describe Jewish applicants decades before, and Asian Americans are seen as hardworking, textureless, grinds who are lacking the character and personal qualities that are desirable to institutions like Harvard. And in 1988, the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights opens an investigation into Harvard's admissions process, specifically the allegation that Harvard is discriminating against Asian American applicants in particular. And two years later, the investigation concluded and found that Harvard's, you know, they, they went through Harvard admissions officers' notes on applicants' files, and, and they found some stereotypes like, oh, these Asian Americans are diligent, and of course, he wants to be a doctor, and, you know, they're quiet, shy, they're science and math oriented, they're hard workers, those, those are the kinds of words that you see. But the report by the government found that Asian Americans were admitted at lower rates than white applicants, not necessarily because of specific discrimination, but because things like legacy admissions and um, ath athletic recruits, like those tended to favor white students. And so it wasn't necessarily that you were discriminating against Asian Americans, it's that, that the pool that was explicitly preferred, you know, namely athletes and legacies, were largely white. So, it, so yes, Asians were admitted at lower rates, but not because of discrimination necessarily, it's because of this other preference that was race neutral, even though the pool was largely white. So um, it reasoned that the, that was how the, the disparity could be attributable, and so there, the government ultimately did not find that there was intentional discrimination. So 2003, this is the case where Justice O'Connor reaffirms um, Bakke, and the Supreme Court hands down Grutter versus Bollinger, which conservatives were really hoping would be the end of affirmative action. Um, and the plaintiff there was a white female applicant who was rejected from the University of Michigan Law School, and she alleged that the admissions preferences for racial minorities unconstitutionally, unconstitutionally discriminated against her on the basis of her race, but the court went with the liberals in a 5-4 decision, thanks to um, Sandra Day O'Connor, um, who died today. Um, her opinion appeared to give affirmative action a finite grace period, because she included the sentence, we expect that, in, that 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary. Right? We expect that 25 years from now, racial preferences will no longer be necessary. And so, but what Grutter did was to say, it is lawful for a school to treat race as a plus factor for underrepresented minorities in order to achieve a student, a student body that is diverse. Um, her opinion did explicitly say in passing that Asian Americans and Jews are not included in affirmative action because they are not underrepresented. This was a plus factor for race that was given to underrepresented minorities. So that understanding was pretty clear by 2003. Um, Clarence Thomas, being the only black justice on the court, um, was conservative, who was once known to his law school classmates as a radical black nationalist. And his dissenting opinion in Grutter uh, begins by quoting Frederick Douglass. Um, and he strongly believed that affirmative action was racial discrimination. Uh, most importantly against black people whom it was designed to help. And um, so he also emphasized that racial, he, he, his quote was, racial discrimination in higher education admissions will be illegal in 25 years, which is not exactly what O'Connor said, but you know, that's how he took it to mean. So in the, these last decades, you know, leading up to 2023, um, I have felt really sorry for schools because they've had to navigate the court's kind of like conflicting or impossible to reconcile directives on affirmative action because the school can't do racial quotas. So they can't sort of say, we're roughly aiming for 10% or 15% or, you know, we, we, they, they can't do that. And they can't internally even talk about it that way. They can't say um, what level of minority involve, uh, enrollment is going to actually serve the educational benefits of diversity that they're allowed to seek. So they're, they're prohibited from doing that, but they are allowed to say, 
that um, you can that you can consider so explicitly consider somebody's race, but the court also made clear that a university's goals cannot be quote illusory or amorphous; they must be sufficiently measurable to permit judicial scrutiny of the policies adopted. So on the one hand, you can't set numerical targets for diversity. At the same time, you have to have something be measurable, sufficiently measurable. Um, and that always struck me as impossible. And that set schools up on this very incoherent and mysterious path. Um, and every time they would say something about their admissions process, it sounded like word salad because they just, they were caught between a rock and a hard place. And so the majority of the court um, had never said that remedi remediating past societal discrimination, including the effects of slavery and segregation, um, was a compelling interest. So the idea of affirmative action, um, then you know the, that path was shut off, and so diversity was the only really permissible way to talk about why they were doing affirmative action. Um, so. Then we get a suit in 2014 against Harvard University. It was well known that for the past decades, um, it was Harvard had around 18, or hovered around 18 percent Asian American, and um, and that since the 80s, Asian Americans, you know, they were admitted with higher, substantially higher SAT scores than white students to be admitted to selective schools, um, not just underrepresented minorities, but the comparison between white and Asian was, you know, that was stark in that Asians had, you know, at least 150 points um, or somewhere around there. They had to have a higher SAT score in terms of when you saw who got admitted. So past cases on affirmative action had alleged that, that affirmative action was bad because it discriminated against white people. But the new lawsuit in, filed in 2014 would instead allege that Harvard's admissions process favored white applicants over a racial minority group. That was the explicit complaint. Um, and that the use of race in admissions was resulting in an unlawful preference for white applicants over Asian Americans. There have been very few Supreme Court cases in our history that have focused on Asian Americans. Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard is one of them. And um, in some ways, it was litigated as a very straightforward allegation of intentional discrimination against Asian Americans. But of course, SSFA appended this other claim, which is that race-based affirmative action should be declared unlawful. That is separate from the claim that Asians are intentionally discriminated against in favor of white students. Um, so the affirmative action challenge was put aside at the district court level because the Supreme Court precedents clearly allowed affirmative action um, as long as it was done correctly, and the district court did not have the power to overrule Supreme Court precedents. So very few people who wrote about this case took the time to note that these two distinct legal claims were present in the case and that one dropped out immediately at the district court level. Um, and the litigation was all about whether Harvard was intentionally discriminating against Asian American students. And the trial focused on that allegation and the um, def Harvard's defense, of course Harvard kept bringing up the defense of like, oh, we like diversity and we do affirmative action because the idea was to wrap its defense on the intentional discrimination claim in the benefits of diversity and affirmative action. The other side, SSFA also, um, wanted to focus on Asian American discrimination, but they of course knew that ultimately, come what may, they would be going to the Supreme Court to challenge affirmative action in the Supreme Court, which they could not do in the lower courts. Um, so we can talk about the trial evidence in the case, um, maybe in the Q&A, but it was, you know, I would say the most striking piece of evidence to me was that Harvard sent recruiting letters to potential applicants in certain Midwestern and Western states, for example. And, you know, how are they going to choose who to send letters to? Well, they used a PSAT cutoff. And Harvard used a PSAT cutoff for 1310 for white students in those regions. And they used a 1350 for Asian American females. And they, a 1380 for Asian American males. 
and that there were gasps in the courtroom when that evidence was revealed. Um, the district court said that the disparity between Asian and white students um, was not the result of discriminatory animus or conscious prejudice. Um, maybe implicit discrimination, but she did not think that these um, imperfections were enough to constitute intentional discrimination. So the judge um, decided in favor of Harvard. SSFA lost its claim that Harvard intentionally discriminated. And then, of course, it went to the Supreme Court to ask it to review the case. And now SSFA switches gears entirely and pretty much just asks the Supreme Court to overrule the affirmative action precedents. Um, and so by this point, the balance on the court has shifted from, since 2014. And it's not like it was a big suspense what was going to happen. And in June, the Supreme Court handed down SSFA versus Harvard, ending race conscious admissions in university admissions after 45 years of saying that it was permissible. Um, and the conclusion is that diversity is not a compelling interest. It's not an illegitimate interest, right? It's not like you're, you're not permitted to pursue it, but you, it's not a compelling interest and therefore you can't use race in order to try to achieve it. Um, and so what comes after SSFA versus Harvard, and I will end in, in, in a minute, um, Harvard in, strongly argued that the impact of eliminating affirmative action would be dire, and that if it didn't use race in admissions, more than a third of admitted Hispanics and more than half of admitted African Americans would most likely not be admitted. That means only two thirds of Hispanics and less than half of black students currently on campus would be there if um, Harvard didn't use um, affirmative action. That's what they said in litigation. And, um, and they said it's not feasible for maintaining diversity unless it took other drastic measures that it didn't want to take. Um, one, of, one of which included getting rid of uh, preference for legacies. So um, those measures are, of course, now underway. The, you know, they have to be race neutral <laughs> measures, not considering people's race. The current freshman class of Harvard is 30% Asian. And so after SFA Harvard, are we looking at a class of 40%, 50%, 60%? Um, there are some high schools in New York that are purely exam based that have like 70%. Um, is that what we have in store? Making test scores optional is one thing that many schools have done, but they could eliminate consideration of it altogether. And that's one workaround because that's race neutral. And test scores tend to advantage Asian American applicants over others. Um, and so if you get rid of that, that gets rid of that Asian American advantage. If you promote students from low income neighborhoods, or poorly funded schools, that goes some of the way. Um, and a striking fact is that the large role of legacies and athletic recruits, children of donors, children of faculty and staff, and it turns out that these groups comprise about one third of each Harvard class, at, but are admitted at eight times the rate of other applicants. So there, and, and those preferences currently disproportionately benefit white applicants. So those things have to, you know, are certainly discussed, being discussed right now um, about what to do. And we're going to be seeing some changes. I don't know what the class that's being admitted right now will look like. I suspect we will have the whitest and most Asian class um, in a very long time, and that it will take some years for the numbers to change as they implement more and more measures that are race neutral that are aimed at achieving diversity. Um, we can't, certainly can't expect it to all happen in one year. Um, so the landscape after SSFA versus Harvard, um, it's not going to be limited to colleges, and it's not going to be limited to admissions. We're already seeing lawsuits following through on the implications of SSFA versus Harvard in various contexts like employment. Um, and efforts to hire racially diverse workers. 
scholarships and fellowships and benefits that are intended specifically for underrepresented minorities will likely soon be illegal. Um, there's a venture capital firm that is organized to fund black owned businesses. That venture capital fund has been sued. That suit li appears likely to be successful. And efforts to increase diversity in corporate boards or nonprofit boards, those are currently largely white and male. Those will come under scrutiny. Organizations and programs that have the mission of providing services to certain underserved racial or ethnic communities might have to reformulate their aims. And then, of course, there's a question of the military. Right now, the it's unanswered whether you know, West Point or the Naval Academy can take race into account in admissions for purposes of proving, of producing a diverse military, which the government has represented is profoundly important um, for producing uh, the conditions for protecting our national security. So these questions are very likely to be addressed in the near future. Um, I do not think that there's any chance that this court is going to say, OK, admissions, you can't consider race, but employment, you can. I just, I don't see that happening for a variety of reasons. Um, so let me just stop there and um, I welcome the discussion and your questions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so uh, questions from first Harvey Silverglade. I've had some personal experiences in this area. <laughs> Um, my son is now 44. He has, has still a friend who's a black boy who was raised in Roxbury. His mother, realizing how bad the schools were, asked if he could live with us Monday to Friday and go with my son to Cambridge Elementary School and then to Ridge Lab. Mm -hmm. So he lived with us Monday to Friday. And um, I would be there when they're doing their homework. And the kid's name is, first name is Eugene. And he would say to Isaac, I don't have to bother with this. I'm going to get into school as affirmative action. And I would go storming in there and say, Eugene, do your homework. Don't depend on affirmative action. It may not be around forever. Do your homework. And he, um, he did his homework. Um, he studied very hard. He graduated, graduated college. Um, he's now a professional. He has... He's married, lives in Maryland, and has uh, three kids who are very, doing very well in school. And it occurred to me that we have a problem of um, low expectations, that by the affirmative action, and I, I turned against affirmative action, because what I decided was that it made a lot of minority kids think that they didn't really have to work hard. And one of the problems they have is that their parents often cannot help them with homework. So I had suggested to Harvard that didn't take me seriously, even though I'm a graduate of their law school. They never take me seriously, actually. I suggested to Harvard that it have a program where undergraduates be teamed up with kids in Cambridge, mostly minority kids, but any kid who was having trouble academically, whose parents could not help with homework because the parents did not have a good education. And that those, um, like Phillips Brooks House could do something like this. Um, and um, because kids need help with homework and parents can't help them, who is? And so I think that this is really, so I, I, um, I think that the end of affirmative action has to be accompanied by a social obligation to help these kids. There's nothing inherently, there's no inherent reason why these kids cannot succeed. They just need some help that parents often cannot give them. I think that um, with affirmative action, you had the consideration of race at the point of admissions. But I think that um, there's a lot that universities can do. And I don't think it's unrealistic to expect a Harvard or a Yale to invest in um, finding promising um, groups of kids who are disadvantaged, who don't have the kind of resources that your son grew up with, and finding them really early, like in eighth grade. 
and, and investing in programs that would try to help them be in a position to be competitive um, for, for uh, elite school admissions later on. And I, I have a feeling that like these kinds of solutions, which we have to consider because of SSFA versus Harvard and would not have been considered earlier, um, are, you know, will be, will actually be part of the solution. Um, and who knows if it'll be sufficient to achieve the kind of diversity that universities are now very committed to. They're not gonna stop caring about diversity because the Supreme Court said it wasn't a compelling interest. As long as it remains a legitimate interest, they will keep thinking that that is um, an important part of their educational mission. And, um, and so they're gonna have to find race neutral alternatives, including investing in social programs that they otherwise would not have. Yes. Clarify, like, like a compelling interest versus yeah. Yeah. So um, the Supreme Court has um, has kind of a default position that if um, the government, or in some cases, a private institution like Harvard, um, is considering someone's race, that that is presumptively a very suspicious thing for them to be doing. Right, because I mean that that and that comes. You can see why, because it comes out of the civil rights movement and the idea that if you're making distinctions between people, like you better have a really good reason for it. And so the way they look at this is, let's say there's a law that makes a distinction that says, like, you know, uh, black people can do this and white people can't. Let's say that's the law. Um, what the court would do is say, um, you have to show that you have a compelling reason for considering race and that it is narrowly tailored to the actual goal that you're trying to achieve. And so that's a really stringent test. So it's not that you can never consider race, but if you, if you can consider race as long as you pass that test, is it a compelling interest that, um, you know, that satisfies a, uh, that, that serves an, a, a is it a compelling interest that is served by the means that you chose? And essentially, for years, for 45 years, doing this in the context of admissions, considering race in the way that, you know, the, as one factor among many, was considered okay because it was a compelling interest to seek diversity and it was considered a narrowly tailored way to accomplish it. And now we're in a world, as of June, where that, um, that diversity is no longer a compelling interest. But the court didn't say it's impermissible as an interest for schools to pursue. They just couldn't pursue it through the means of considering somebody's race. Does that make sense? Yes, and then Shep. Sure. Uh, thank you for your talk. In the Supreme Court decision, they say that you can't use race explicitly, but that yeah. universities can consider an applicant's discussion of how race affected his or her life, be it through discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise. Yeah. And in the Harvard official response to the decision, mm -hmm. they quoted, quoted that in the first paragraph, and then they say, we will certainly comply with the court's decision, <laughs> which I, I think indicate many people read that to say Harvard believed it was essentially a loophole that would allow them to more or less do what they're already doing. And I, I just wonder if you could comment on what you see as the practical implications of that caveat in the decision mm -hmm. and to what extent you think universities will use that to yeah. sort of reconstitute what they're doing in, in a slightly different form. I'm so glad you asked that because that is of course the paragraph that everyone will obsess over for years. Um, it's, I have heard admissions officers, not at Harvard, you know, no admissions officer at Harvard, I've heard admissions officers say things like, well, that paragraph allows us to do what we've been doing all along, because what we've been doing, we, we never really considered it like just a checkbox. We always considered the person's whole story and how the race affected their lives and how they thought about their race and they're writing these essays. And so the checkboxes really decide the point. We always considered it that way. We will not have to change anything that we do. Um, I have heard some people say that. I have also heard Harvard's lawyer, Bill Lee, say in a public forum that that is insane. That that is not, at least as he represented, that is not Harvard's position. Um, Harvard does 
indeed think that much has changed, that they cannot keep doing it the way they were doing it um, in the last admission cycle. So yes, you can consider someone's race, but I don't think Harvard thinks that is the same as like that that is going to get us to the kind of diversity that they were able to produce um, using affirmative action the, the old way. Um, so some people can say it's a loophole and they can take their chances and just do what they were doing. But I kind of think that their general counsels will be advising them not to do that because they will, you know, then they can spend, you know, 10 years litigating against SSFA versus Harvard, who is definitely on the lookout for things that sound like they're not planning to change what they're doing. Because I, uh, Robert's also articulated right after that, that paragraph, like, don't think that that means you can keep <laughs> doing what you're doing um, through some other nebulous means. Trap. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I want to take up on your invitation talk to go beyond higher education. I have three contacts of interest in what you think the effect of the decision will be. One is in uh, K through 12 education, where the courts seem to go quite a bit further than they had in the, the parents involved in K through 12 and 7. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of uh, schools that have this kind of diversified yes. uh, um, uh, assignment process. Right. Uh, I know that my, my grandkids go to school in Berkeley. And I know that you know, race plays a big part, and uh, not explicitly, but in all that. So that's one situation. Second situation I've seen about Thomas Jefferson High School yes. in, in uh, Virginia. Um, the Fourth Circuit basically heard this case, um, and just for background, the, uh, the, the school might be the best science education school in the country, high school. Um, it's overwhelmingly Asian. There's been a lot of discontent. So they change it so every school gets a certain number of placements. On the one hand, they didn't use racial classifications. On the other hand, I think it was quite clearly aimed at reducing the number of, of Asian students. So that's the second category. And the third category, you mentioned employment discrimination. Um, is one of the implications of this that disparate impact analysis is suspect? And that would have huge implications for employment. Yes, for sure. Um, so on TJ, um, that, was a, that was a race neutral change in admissions policy where like previously they used one method and the class was, I don't know, like 70 something percent Asian. And they're like, this is insufficient diversity. It doesn't reflect the diversity of the counties that feed into the school. So let's do something about the admissions process. So they choose a race neutral change, which is no more standardized tests, which again, we know favors Asians. And we're gonna choose like, you know, we're going to make sure we get a distribution from all of the high schools instead of just from like the gifted and talented ones, you know, middle school ones that obviously Asian moms all flocked to those schools. So wherever you are in the county, all the a lot of the Asian students are concentrated at these like specialized middle schools that already were competitive admissions. And so if you then try to distribute admissions all across the county, then all those Asians who flocked to these specialized schools, like they only a few of them are going to be admitted, and only a few of them are going to be a few of the students from each school will be admitted, so you get a broader representation racially. And that's what they did. Um, and the the Fourth Circuit said that that was not intentional discrimination because, and it, first of all, it's a race neutral method, so sort of presumptively it's race neutral. Uh, presumptively, it's not discriminatory. And then there wasn't kind of a smoking gun showing people going, we are doing this because we want less Asians. Like they, there wasn't sort of an email that said, let's change. You know, what they said was we want more diversity, right? So um, I think that that's an interesting question. And the thing is, under Supreme Court law, like that was the correct result because um, what you'd have to argue is that even though there's not intentional discrimination, this has a disparate impact on Asian Americans. Like even if you didn't intend to reduce Asian numbers and you can't prove that, you can show that it had a disparate impact on Asian Americans because I think the numbers got reduced by, from like 75 to like 55. There's still a majority, right? Um, so it's not like 55 Asian instead of 75. 
Um, and so the disparate impact law in this Supreme Court for, for decades has been horrific for plaintiffs. And those plaintiffs were African American and they lost every time under the disparate impact law in the increasingly conservative Supreme Court. Now, is that law now gonna change to make it easier because the plaintiffs are now Asian? I don't think so. Um, I don't think, because I mean, once you change the disparate impact standard, it would apply to every racial group, including white. Um, so I, I don't see the disparate impact standard getting any less tough. Um, so I think that Asian Americans are not going to prevail um, overall in that kind of scenario. Um, your first question was about employment, right? Well, yeah, um, well, change is disparate impact analysis gets weaker, as seems quite nicely. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, so I, so I guess I'm disagreeing with you. I don't think disparate impact law is going to get weaker. I think it's going to be, as in, well, I don't know what you mean by weaker. I don't, I think it will be hard for plaintiffs to win, whatever their race. Um, because that's the way it's been. I don't, I don't see that changing. Um, and in the employment context, you can bring disparate impact claims because that's under a different statute, Title VII, um, but it's still going to be hard. Oh, yes. This is Dr. Gustafson. She just got her PhD yesterday. Yay. Give her a hand. Yay. <laughs> Hi, um, so I guess one of my questions is, is more informational. Um, I, I've listened in on you know, courses here at Harvard yeah. that are tackling this issue, thinking about this issue. And I've often heard students here say something to the effect of legacy admissions being affirmative action for white students. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like, based on your presentation, there might be something to that. So I was just wondering sure. informationally, like, like what percentage of white students here at Harvard are neither athletes nor legacies? <laughs> uh, I like, wish I had that breakdown. Maybe I, I should look for that. Yeah, that would just be like That would be really good to, to know, yeah. Um, because, yeah, that would just be fascinating yeah. to tell. Um, and then... So there was a, a very interesting article or op-ed in the Crimson earlier this week that praised the fact that agnostics and atheists are now the two largest religious groups here at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And those identifying as Protestant are now something like 14%. Wow. Or something. And this was praised by the Crimson as evidence diversity? of overcoming, oh, diversity, evidence of overcoming <clears throat> Harvard's dis, you know, discriminatory past, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And so I was wondering, just from a... a from your point of view on, on affirmative action, will this way of thinking, do you think, stay limited to race because of the compelling historic you know, issues there? Or is this going to fracture in some way and cause additional legislation or, or litigation about other kinds of viewpoint diversity? So yeah, speak? amazing. Yeah, amazing question. I had not really focused on because we're right now in a period where the Supreme Court is applying concept of, of diversity to religion in a way that is very different from how it had thought about religion in the past. Yeah. I mean, because- I also I was sort of on this point. How, how would, in, in the 1920s, 1930s, Harvard have established the Jewish identity, I presume by last names, that's how they yeah. figured out if someone was Jewish or not, right? So not by asking, their, not by openly discriminating against them on the basis of check a box for your religion. But yeah, you know, I think that, I think that it was often um, clear because of last name, and perhaps in that time, it was common for say recommenders to like make comments or say coded things that made it clear that someone was Jewish. Um, I think that um, the religion point is so interesting. Um, in theory, and probably in reality, that Harvard is considering things like they say diversity of all kinds. And so clearly religious diversity, they wouldn't want an all Christian school or an all, you know, any religious group or all atheists, that that would be something, and I'm sure many students write about their religious faith or involvement in religious organizations as part of what makes them unique and what kind of contribution they can make to the university. So they are thinking about that, but to the extent that one can sort of trace this and, and say, oh, there are so few Christians compared to the number of Christians who are in the applicant pool or the number of Christians who are in the general 
population is, you know, kind of like with the Asian American claim, like, is this a quota on Christians? And is that a kind of um, discrimination? Um, it, there are other groups that will certainly use SSFA versus Harvard. I hadn't thought about religion, but certainly women, because it is known that right now, if you don't use gender, like if you do a gender-blind admissions process, it is very clear that the all the schools would be a strong majority female, um, and that you have to give a boost to male applicants um, for a variety of reasons that have to do with like why you know young men aren't doing as well as young women in our society right now, and that's been going on for for some time, and also like even things like getting your application in on time with all the pieces completed, from what I'm hearing, boys have trouble doing that. And so like often they're having to chase down boys and like call their mothers <laughs> to like get their, get their things in. Um, and so it's just, boys are definitely being given some slack in the admissions process. Now, is that okay under SSFA versus Harvard? Race is not the same as gender. You are, the court is more forgiving about the consideration of race, but not entirely forgiving. Even We're not doing strict scrutiny like with the compelling interest, but you have to pass something called intermediate scrutiny, which is that there has to be an important interest and that it is um, substantially related to the goal. The goal being we want a gender balanced class because it's better for society if like Harvard doesn't all, you know, if isn't like 70% female or something. Um, and so, I, but I still think a, a, there would be a reasonable challenge, a really good one, that women's groups could bring using SSFA versus Harvard to challenge the use of gender in um, admissions process. But we've got a political mismatch because the, the groups that would advocate for this, na, uh, for women's rights, like the national, you know, like national groups that represent, you know, these rights, are not really that likely to champion SSFA versus Harvard as a case that they want to make even more law building up. So I think it'll take some time. I mean, maybe a conservative women's rights group could do it. I'm thinking that um, all diversity is viewpoint diversity and should be judged by that standard. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, because why is it that you want uh, black students, Asian students? I mean, it's because they think a bit differently, that have di different experiences, and therefore they say something which is different from what other people contribute. So that the, the test is really what, what they say. Mm -hmm. it's the, the, the size and shape of your nose it doesn't give you something that makes you interesting. But mm -hmm. you know, um, your race or your, your sex, I like to use that word, uh, can, uh, so does the can influence court. what you say, and, yes. that, and, and therefore, uh, uh, um, I'll make another assertion, and, uh, diversity with a capital D has reduced diversity in the universities rather than increased it, judged mm -hmm. by the standard of viewpoint diversity, which is the true standard. How about that? Okay, so what I will say is, it would be great if we considered diversity in all its forms, including viewpoint. Sometimes the viewpoint diversity tends to drop out, but I think this is a really good time for us to reassess and think viewpoint diversity is absolutely one of the things that actually makes a university what it is. Like, what is the point of being here if everybody thinks the same thing? Um, but right now, more than ever, what you're seeing is Okay, we've got people here um, who have a certain life experience. And because of that life experience, it's not like it came out of nowhere, because of that life experience, they see, they can see what is happening in Israel and Gaza. And that life experience makes them very co compellingly and sincerely believe that what is going on is a genocide. On the other side, because of someone's life experience, you know, they grew up, you know, hearing phrases like from the river to the sea, and it meant something. It meant something specific. It wasn't just like a rallying cry for freedom. Because of that life experience, they see what's going on in an utterly different way. And I just think that's what diversity 
at the end of the day, that's what diversity is. It's not about your skin color. It is about your life experience. And you can see things, you can see the same photograph and it will mean something utterly different. You can say the same phrase, it will mean something utterly different. And it comes back to your life experience. I, the, the idea that somehow what the university is doing, you're trying to achieve some kind of colorful rainbow of races, I mean, that's a very reductive idea that that's what this is about. Um, I think this is about different life experiences, it, which is where you get the different kinds of viewpoints. Not that everyone who has that life experience would have the same yeah. viewpoint, but that often people are coming out of their life experience and saying, yeah. you know, just as Thomas is saying, because of my life experience of being severely discriminated against, I have this one view. And other people think, well, you had that life experience, so you should be having the other view. Well, I, I, that's to me, that's diversity. Um, but I, 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 it still is the case that the life experience is something that uh, I would care about. OK, but look, I'm neither a Jew nor a Palestinian. I, don't, I have no relevant life experience. Am I not entitled to an opinion on the... Uh, no, of course you're the, entitled to an opinion because so, you have, you so have your own store of knowledge, study, yeah. you know, consideration, and also <laughs> life experience as whatever you are. All right. I'm, I, I'm, I'm doubtful about the sovereignty of life experience over thought. I think that thought and life experience are neither, ni neither of them is sovereign over the other. Uh-huh, okay. <laughs> I've got a sort of a life experience related uh, uh, observation. Which I saw a study some years ago, I don't remember what that um, um, but the, when the litigation was, was first proceeding, that, that looked really carefully at the numbers that uh, Asians obviously were being discriminated against based on kind of test scores and admission. But actually the group it found that was most being, most heavily discriminated against was red state white, uh -huh. um, for whatever that's worth. And, uh -huh. uh, and, and tend, one, one interesting tidbit with that, there was one extracurricular organization that was really negatively associated with admission to top schools, and that was membership in a 4-H club. Okay. So the way to sink you. Uh, but uh, I, somewhat related to that, you said schools are in between, uh, you know, rock and a hard place, and, and you focus more on what we'll call the, you know, the rock, the... Um, uh, limits on, on how much they can uh, consider race with an added affirmative action. But what about the, the other sides of the, the hard place? Have they effectively faced, you know, uh, tacit or, or, or explicit requirements to consider race? I mean, uh, in terms of disparate impact kind of worries or, uh, or, or whatever it might be? Uh, um, so it, I don't know of a case where a school was investigated purely based on the fact that they didn't have enough diversity, okay? But you raise a really interesting point, which is that the rock in a hard place, like for example, right now, think about the fact that the same statute that this was, you know, that this was litigated under, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which um, prohibits discrimination on the basis of race or national origin um, for, for institutions that receive federal funding, which of course all colleges and universities are, um, that's the case. I mean, that's the statute that was interpreted in the affirmative action case and determined to have this meaning. Um, and now that's the statute that is being used to you know, say that Harvard is discriminating because they are not doing something, uh, they're not doing sufficient, they're not taking sufficient steps to address anti-Semitism on campus. Um, and, and the Department of Education is now investigating Harvard for that because they didn't do enough. Um, so again, there's, there's, it, it's always the, the conflicting, you know, there, it's like if they do stuff and try to address anti-Semitism, right, to the extent that you have a conflict like right now where, you know, a lot of people think you should say something pro-Palestinian, that's anti-Semitic, right? And then it, it goes into, it, there's a very conflicting directives. And I think the university continues um, with standards like Title VI and, and how, however you interpret what it means to discriminate, you're going to be stuck between that rock and a hard place. And um, we're not going to, this is not going to get rid of the problem. So I, I really, this is something that's like, I really want to work out more and probably will write about because it's very hard. You don't want to say, um, everything's allowed 
and you don't want to say nothing's allowed. And so the law often does take this something in between, but either either side you're facing sanctions. Yes, Keith. Thanks for your talk and thanks for your work too on uh, sexual harassment consent, which has been so important in educational space as well. Um, so I just want to push a little further on the life experience standard, I guess I'll call it, as, mm-hmm. as a goal there. I mean, couldn't one make the argument that, in fact, to have a robust discussion of important matters that mean, that are, are deeply felt and mean of great importance to the members of the discussion, that it's better to have a non-diverse group in terms of different groups and different geographies and different um, life experience and so forth, that, in fact, diversity, when we study it politically, let's say, tends to lead to a decrease in trust, mm-hmm. a decrease in the ability to share ideas, yeah. a decrease in the ability to talk meaningfully about these things. And that by pushing, whether it's geography or life experience, economic differences and so forth, we've actually led to a decrease in the ability to reason, deliberate together, and have actual intellectual or viewpoint diversity. Mm-hmm. Again, I mean, isn't that a challenge to where you're kind of pushing towards with the life experience standard? Um, so I think if it, I think to the extent that you're saying it's it makes it more challenging to have the kind of environment where intellectual discourse, civil, you know, civil discourse, you know, open inquiry, you know, everyone trusting each other to not, you know, that you, you say something, you don't immediately get offended and you're able to engage. Yeah, of course, it's much harder to do that in a diverse group than in a homogeneous group. But that's the challenge of our society, isn't it? Like it would be much easier in America if we had all white people or all one race. And but we're not like that. We're we are most definitely not that. And because this is about a university that is not in France or in Germany or, you know, like, you know, a nation state, we are in the United States of America. Um, which is built on a very different idea. And to the extent that a university like Harvard wants to you know, prepare people to be you know, citizens in that kind of democracy, like we want those challenges to be encountered on our campus instead of like retreating to our own enclaves and having those wonderful discussions. Um, you know, it's, I'm very troubled when I talk to undergrads and when I say open inquiry, does that happen for you on, on Harvard's campus? And they basically say no for many of the reasons you're saying, but then they'll be like, but among trusted friends, very carefully selected, vetted, trusted friends I can have. And, and maybe they mean people who are not that diverse. Maybe people they mean people who are s- similar to them. Maybe they mean people who are diverse, but they have gotten to know them better. So then, you know, but if the university can be a place where people who are really different, who otherwise might have these difficulties, and like they kind of struggle through those difficulties and get to a point where they can have these dialogues, maybe we wouldn't see the kind of polarization that that we currently are experiencing. And I, I don't think we're doing a good job of it right now. Don't get me wrong. I just think yeah. the aspiration has to be there. I would never just accede to your vision. Yeah, well, I, I think all of us would agree we're doing a bad job. The question is, do we double down in certain ways or not? And that's that's what I'm pushing yeah. out there, primarily around the issue of trust as being essential to academic freedom, intellectual discussion. Yeah, yeah the trust is a real problem right now, but not just at Harvard. It's like everywhere. And so we, we can't give up on it. We have to try. Yes. <clears throat> Adding to what you just said, um, I remember growing up and my father saying certain things to me, which in a way is an indoctrination on how I'm supposed to see the world and other people. And it takes um, sort of an intellectual honesty to read and read different points of view to overcome that indoctrination, because those are like these guiding principles that sit deep in your brain that supercharge everything you think about. And the importance is how do you get 
over that and look at things around you more clearly and then have an honest discussion. But you have to turn off those certain words that you've heard. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Yeah, life experience, it's the chain and the cave. But it's not, it's not, I mean, life experiences are things that when I was going to school and interactions, but there are these little subtle words and thoughts yeah. that are put in your brain mm -hmm. that unless you can honestly look at what that meant, you're not going to get anywhere. Right. And are you saying, therefore, we you agree or disagree? Well, <clears throat> it's a personal... I think you have to undergo a personal change. Because I raised a son... And I said to myself, I'm not going to say those subtle things that my father told me because they, they weren't helpful and they were, they were very destructive. And I want to have my son look at the world more clearly than I was able to do. Yeah. Well, um, so here's something that might be surprising to you given this debate we've been having about life experience. In my class, whether it's constitutional law, family law, or criminal law, I do not allow students to say things like, as an Asian woman, or as someone who has experienced, you know, abortion, or, you know, as someone who has a mom who was a single mom, or you know, anything like that. I just don't allow it. Like it's a explicit in my syllabus that you are not allowed to say that in my class. And you're not even allowed to say, my friend had a divorce or, you know, my friend got stopped by the police or, you know, you just, you, you can't do that in my class. Now you might be surprised because I've just been, you know, a, a big fan of like, you know, life experience being important to people's, you know, intellectual journey. And um, I just, for me, the classroom space is one where you have limited time. And if people start reverting to that, people, it, it's, you know, I, it has a silencing effect where Harvey might feel like, oh, I'm not Jewish. I'm not Palestinian. So what do I have to con contribute to this debate? Or he might feel like I have to bring up the fact that I'm not Palestinian or Jewish and to, to make a point seem legitimate because other people are bringing up their backgrounds. Um, and some people might not want to share about their backgrounds. They might want to just talk about the case. So I, I do have that very strict rule and I really enforce it. Um, and, you know, maybe it's a contradiction, from, but I don't think so. I think that, you know, the fact that they are there with their life experiences, that is enough. It doesn't mean that in the class discussion, they have to say, you know, I have this view about abortion because I couldn't get one in this state, and it was the most horrible experience of my life. Uh, I, that's just not something they can do in my classroom. You want to give them a life experience of being a student? <laughs> yeah. And being forced, to trans, being forced to channel the ideas that their life experience may have given them into actual arguments, arguments. Reasons, yeah. yes. And the opportunity to also separate from those life experiences if that's what they want to do. I had a very quick follow-up to Sarah about um, that, that time has passed a little bit, but when you mentioned there were gasps in the courtroom and it was that found out that Harvard recruits um, at, uh, what did you say, the difference between uh, Asian females and uh, 13, to black Yeah, there, there's the, no, 50 and then 1310 30. for white, 1350 for Asian females, I and see. 1380 for white right. males. Oh, for white males. For white okay. males. So, the white entire, so that's the thing. This litigation was about white versus Asian. And nobody really gets that. I because it was 1380 yeah, for white, right. uh, for, uh, for, uh, for Asian Oh, yeah. Males. I got it wrong. I got it wrong. It's okay. 1310 for white people. Right. 1350 for Asian girls right. and 1380 for right. Asian boys. So I was going to hone in on that, on the difference, on the 30 difference between uh, uh, girls and boys, because um, Shep, it's, it's Shep Explain, and you made a big point of that too, that um, now it's actually men that are discriminated against because they have to boost them. So if you didn't try for this diversity, do you have numbers on 
um, if we just went with SAT scores, how much would the, the highest ones, how much would the women versus men um, gap? I don't actually know that. I don't actually know that. I mean, I have always traditionally like, thought that, that um, boys tend to do better than girls on these kinds of um, aptitude type tests. At, that's I mean, that's at been the, very, the very top list. yeah at the very yeah. But I I don't know. That may have changed by now, just with the you know with the shifts that we've seen, and especially since the pandemic. Apparently, the pandemic was like a big inflection point too, huh. that boys like struggled that more than girls in terms of this academic achievement gap. Um, but. Yeah. Because that was a bit of a contradiction. I mean, that the, the boys do much better than, than the Asian girls, but yet Harvard has, has to boost it. Um, uh, and I, I just, uh, said, just yeah. add that if you look at grades, two thirds of the highest um, 10% 10, 10 of grades are female. Mm -hmm. So if you look at grades as well as that's a T, boys don't do well at all. Yeah. Right, but grades, are they all weighted according to AP or like even higher yeah. classes than that? That's or, good that I, I, I mean, mean generally, grades are so subjective. Right, right. but in, in general, Harvard, they try to have a really good, accurate sense with the weighting and like they, they, ha they have like a systematic way of considering the kind of school it is and, you know, and they try to get to know each school so, so that they can do that accurately. Um, okay, Harvey. No, you go ahead. I already had one question, so why don't you go first? <laughs> no, sir. Okay, you go. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, first, uh, on the sports recruits comment, I just want to express here, the Crimson this week had a headline about how uh, the athletes' scores are 150 points lower than the average, and I thought that that was a nasty thing to have in the paper. I think that should go unspoken. You know, I think creates division. But <laughs> my real question, I, I felt very strongly when I saw it. But my real question on the topic of uh, affirmative action and the recent decision is you mentioned, or it was mentioned that it was the Title Seven of the Civil Rights Title Act. Six. Or Title Six of the Civil Rights Act that it was litigated under. In my reading of the first case uh, at, uh, during which affirmative action was brought to the court, it seemed to me that uh, Title VI and the 14th Amendment, they were deliberately conflated. That's correct. And so it yeah. became not only a something that the nation's representatives have decided um, ought to be, that schools should not discriminate against race, but it became something constitutional and that the nation's representatives couldn't change, or the people couldn't change if they wanted to, or unless, if they didn't want to change the Constitution. When, according to my reading of the most recent case, it didn't seem like that was clarified, whether it was statutory or constitutional, this requirement. And so my question is, you know, what is it according to the case, you know, the current this law, case. Mm -hmm. and what is it according to what your interpretation of the current law, mm -hmm. and what do you think it ought to be? Yeah, so in 1978 in Baki, you were correct that the, um, the court just said without real reasoning or explanation, um, Title VI, which is a statute that, as I said, binds all schools that receive federal funding, and that virtually includes every private, and public school. Um, the 14th Amendment, of course, only binds public schools. So essentially, um, the court just said, almost just, just by fiat, we're just going to make those uniform in terms of the judicial standard. So whatever we say is required under Title VI is the same that would be required under the 14th Amendment and vice versa. So we don't have to think about, oh my god, are, are private schools under a different standard than public schools? And you know, so, so they just said, let's just make it simple. And let's, and, but there isn't sort of legal reasoning for doing that. And that was, has not been you know, really disturbed for all these years. In SSFA versus Harvard, there's a footnote that pretty much just accepts that that's the state of play. And so if you read the, the SSFA versus Harvard case, it's, you know, it will be sounding like a constitutional case because they're using constitutional standards. And that is because it's operating under the assumption established in Baki 
that everything that is constitutionally required or prohibited under the Constitution would be similarly required or prohibited under Title VI. So there was an amicus brief filed in the case um, trying to say, hey, this was never a good idea to unify these standards. What was the reason for that? Let's, let's do something different so that schools that are bound by the 14th Amendment would have a certain requirement and the Title VI would be different. But because Title VI binds every school, private and public, it seemed more like a distinction without a difference, um, except for the purists who are like, no, we got to get the law right. We got to say accurately what the law requires under the 14th Amendment. But practically speaking, public schools are also bound by Title VI. So whatever you say about Title VI, it's, you know, it, it goes to all the schools. Does that make sense? All, all schools get federal funding. Right, you know, and almost all of them the do. Sort of accidental fact that justifies this legal. It's not mode. accidental because that's what the statute says. Like, it's like, yeah. if you don't want to be bound by this, go ahead. I mean, if you don't, right. you can be completely free from those civil rights laws in our country yeah. by just not accepting uh, federal funding if right. you're a school or an institution or a foundation or you know, any, any kind of institution that could accept, like, you know, even like NEH grants or NEA grants or um, things like that. So, but we obviously, and many universities have to accept all kinds of scientific, it's the main thing is the scientific grants that, you know, to totally fuel all of the scientific work in this university. That's the main issue. Yes, Harvey, and then the lady. As a free speech absolutist, what do you think of the adoption of campus speech codes and the theory that they, uh, you're not supposed to say anything that is severely offends people on the basis of race, religion, gender, or sexual orientation. Uh, well, I think severely offends is just a crazy standard to adopt for anything. But I, what I think is there's academic freedom or free speech, however you decide to call it, and that covers a certain area and protects people from uh, saying all kinds of things like that are controversial or bothersome or things like that. Um, and then there are things that we consider to be not academic freedom, and there might be debate, but basically I think that there's consensus that if you are engaging in what is like defined as harassment, not, it's not like I get to decide what harassment means, it's like there's a definition of harassment that exists in a particular university. There's a different definition of what constitutes discriminatory conduct, and obviously that conduct can be engaged in with one's mouth, um, with words. Um, and then there is you know, things like incitement to violence or true threats, those kinds of things. And that's plenty for me. I don't believe that a free spe uh, speech code saying, for example, like, oh, hate speech is not allowed, and here's what we're going to I don't think that's needed. We have plenty when it comes to the codes in our school that say you can't engage in discriminatory conduct, you can't engage in harassment, you can't engage in um, threats, intimidation, and then we even have a rights and responsibilities <laughs> statement that makes it clear that every university member has the right to express themselves freely and that academic freedom is part of that and that it's a responsibility also to look out for other people's exercise of those rights. So I, I find that to be enough and I, I would be very, like I would find it to be a, a huge headache to add a speech code and add something like offend, you know, being offended is you know, something that we need to discipline people for. I mean, can we, if we can just like think about our culture and like encourage people to engage in the kind of discourse that we think is um, like ideal in a university, move people toward that without thinking of it as an opportunity to punish and to discipline people and investigate them, I think that would be the best. Question here. Um, it seems to me that uh, kind of Sandra O'Connor's reference to some kind of uh, like a grace period where affirmative action would be allowed and then discontinued is a very kind of like flexible and reasonable um, kind of argument, especially given that America's immigration policies are bound to be ever changing. You know, uh, for example, right now, massive amounts of like Central and South American migrants that. Mm. 
grow up in 25 years uh-huh. and go to Harvard, like, will there be some kind of, you know, action in the future where people are worried about, you know, <coughs> massive overrepresentation of Hispanic um, applicants? Uh-huh. So is the law just allergic to that kind of, like, grace period where, you know, uh, Harvard and the Constitution will not permit some kind of, like, you know, temporary admissions policy to be revisited at some point in the future? Um, <coughs> or is it is that like a reasonable path forward to say, here's where we are now, this is kind of like the forces that we're trying to reason with at the current moment, mm. we'll see again in the future. Right, so I, I was a young lawyer when I read, you know, in 2003, O'Connor saying, we expect that 25 years from now, and I just, I did a double take because that's just not how we think about law. It's like, okay, um, especially constitutional law, like if, if the 14th Amendment mean, means something, it means something. It doesn't mean like in 20, but, but on the other hand, there's a, of course a really flourishing um, and very legitimate form of constitutional interpretation that does posit that like the meaning changes over time, right? But if, you, if at time one, you say, oh, in 25 years approximately, it will like kind of expire this permission will expire, it's really funny. And I think a lot of us who had gone to, you know, just graduated from law school and didn't maybe have the wisdom or the practical um, know-how that that O'Connor had at the time, we thought this was really goofy and weird and like just, we, you know, just weird. Like why would, why would someone do this? But at the same time, I think that, you know, uh, we have in the room actually someone who's written a lot about temporary laws and it turns out that it's not that unusual. Right, um, it's it, it is something that you know, like statutes are often written to sunset after a certain certain number of years. It's just that this is one of the only times I'd seen it in a constitutional case where they were like, "Oh, we predict that in 25 years the constitutional rule will be different." It just seemed really weird, I think, for people who tend to think if the constitution means something, then it means something, and that's why overturning cases is such a big deal because they're essentially saying we got it wrong. They're not necessarily saying. The meaning of the constitution changed. Jake, do you want to say anything about temporary laws? <coughs> I'll do my own or something. Yeah, about those twenty-five years, uh, wouldn't uh, one of the conditions for them to work have been a transition from a system that favored uh, people of color, uh, college admissions? to a system that uh, reforms primary and secondary education, which I guess is the, one of the main reasons why they test lower yeah. uh, and therefore are less easily admitted yeah. if judged by the same, same standards uh, uh, as others. And do you think it's uh, reasonable to expect this to change now that affirmative action has been repealed? And do you think that there is an interest, mostly on the left, I guess, uh, to carry out such a reform? I think that um, that would be great if that were the case. I don't see like very deep commitment to go that deep into the causes of um, differences in, in you know, test scores and, and education, edu- education levels. Um, but I think that Wealthy private universities like Harvard and Yale will do some things um, to try to increase or the access to the pipeline and, and, and things like that. But I think first what they're going to go to is these alternative methods of admission. They're, first, it's going to be like, you know, I think Raj Chetty has this kind of nifty thing where he can show like for example, take our zip code 02138. Like even within our zip code, there's incredible diversity in terms of wealth. And so block by block, you can kind of color code the level of wealth, um, which is race neutral. And then you can, the admissions office can say, you know, if you live on like Brattle Street and Spark Street, you don't get any plus. But if you live uh, in another part of Cambridge that shows that like this level, this, this block is, you know, um, not wealthy at all, then, then you would get the, you know, and you could calibrate it that way. And it could be a very fine grained way of trying to, um, you know, compensate for those disadvantages, which would have started very early 
in life. But obviously, the better, the better thing would be to have a commitment to our educational system and the, in the incredible gross inequality that exists in our education system, which you know, stratifies by, by class, but also by race. And it's not only a class problem because, I mean, if you, um, the, the legacy of 400 years of discrimination and slavery, that's not nothing. It's not just that you didn't get to go to a good school. You can show, you, you look at these studies and, and you can show that even with the same opportunities, there are racial disparities that happen. Um, and that discrimination um, and the sort of generational, um, generational like passing down of experience um, and know-how when it comes to university admissions. Like if you take a, a poor kid whose parents didn't go to college and put him in like a prep school and like a really good elementary school, it doesn't erase, it doesn't actually erase the effects. Um, so it's just a, a really deep intractable problem. And I don't, I feel like I choose to see the SSFA case, even though I disagreed with it, as an opportunity to explore these things and hope that some of those ideas will creatively be pursued. But I don't have a lot of optimism that it will go a lot deeper than the rich universities like trying to adopt certain things to make their pool more diverse. With this prudent statement, we have to stop. And thank you very much for having us. <laughs>